Okay. Um, so my story tonight. Yeah, yeah no one's no one's used the sermon. Let's see if this falls apart again. Yeah, it's gonna fall apart. I just like to make things difficult. So my story tonight focuses, um, and I promise it has to do with transportation. But it starts with an emo moment. Is everyone here familiar with the with an emo moment? Yes. It's one of those those hopefully rare times in your life where bands like Dashboard Confessional and Brand New sound inspired and not like a bunch of whiny white kids. Uh, my epic emo moment happened uh, a long time ago when I land far far away when I was an undergrad, um, and I had the unfortunate luck of falling in love. Uh, with two people. <laughs> now, I, I know what all of you people are thinking, and it wasn't like that. It was worse, because they were best friends, and they lived together. Oh, no. And I know what you're thinking, and it wasn't like that either. <laughs> I wasn't that lucky. <laughs> um, so instead, and I was very, very shy, so instead of, of sort of forming some sort of exciting menage a trois or some sort of strange, exotic relationship. I just sort of hung around and we became this strange sort of family unit. Uh, one of my friends, Jessica, had a, had a daughter and so it kind of, we developed this rhythm where someone would pick up the kid and somebody else would make dinner and somebody else, you know, would clean the house and we had this strange little family that sort of progressed after a few months. And meanwhile, there was me, Pretending I don't know to be gay or something, and I was just sort of floating there, like I, you know, like I wasn't. Yeah, everything worked as long as everything was totally platonic. Unfortunately, my intentions were not very friendly. And and as it, these things usually go. Eventually, uh, this this very delicate house of cards started to fall apart. And well, wouldn't you know, one thing led to another, and. Uh, I started dating one of these two girls. And at first it was great. At first it was great. It was sort of like everything you'd ever wanted. Uh, and then Christmas break happened. We all went our separate ways for a few weeks. And, and, and the problem with distance is sometimes it makes you reconsider things. It makes you see things in a different light. And when we came back together, we, things started to spiral down here. And a few weeks into the semester, we broke up. Well, suddenly, not only as I, did I break up with my girlfriend at the time, which was very traumatic, uh, I, I lost my best friend, but also my other best friend, who suddenly was siding, understandably, of course, with you know, the best friend that she lived with. And um, I, saw, I sort of fell into emo mode. Now, yeah. Emo mode is usually solved by either um, a playing a musical instrument or self-medicating. I have no musical talent, and uh, my drug of choice is Krispy Kreme donuts. Uh, so after drowning my, my sorrows in uh, donuts, <laughs> and, and um, not getting a whole lot done, I got a, an official summons to the, by the head of my program at school, and I was brought in before all of the teachers in my, little, in my program, and I was told that my performance was subpar, and that I was going to be on probation. So here I was, I, I just sort of felt like I'd been divorced, I had been shut out of this family that I had built for myself. And it was such a strange little family, I found it really uncomfortable to go and try to tell people about it. It's not like you can call up your mom. It wasn't the kind of love that your parents, you know, tell you you're going to find when you leave home. And uh, I remember at the end of this little interview, the head of the program looks at me and she goes, well, do you have anything to say for yourself, Joel? And I really wish I had like a harmonica or something, or a guitar. You know, just break it out and, and, and share the blues with her. But I said, no. And I was at a point where you know, confectionery cons consolation wasn't going to be enough. I needed something else. And so I got in my car and I started driving. And there was this canyon road that ran up alongside the university. I started going up the side of this mountain. And driving can be very therapeutic, especially in canyon roads. Um, probably not in the way that it's therapeutic for you. Uh, as an early 20-something-year-old male, 
I found it very therapeutic to go around those curves as fast as I could. You break, and then you accelerate right as you, you hit that curve, and then you hit the straightaway right after the curve, just rocketing out, and it's a thrill. And there's such a good chance that you'll die that as you go around that curve, you forget everything else. You're just focused on surviving. And so I was going up this mountain road around, just whipping around these curves, getting faster and faster and faster until I hit this point where I went around this tight curve and I found my hands were shaking. And that little sensible voice, that, that small, sensible part of myself that was still conscious and aware at this point said, Joel, you know, you should really slow down. But I realized as I was driving up this mountain road that my problems were still sitting with me. They're still sitting shotgun right next to me in that car. And as I, I picked up my right foot and I moved over and I sort of tapped on the brake, my problems leaned over and they whispered in my ear and they said, go faster. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I said out loud, with just my problems and my small scrap of sensibility. I'm going to drive to the top of this mountain. And if I survive, then something about my life is worth living. And if I don't, to hell with it. And I smashed on that accelerator and I started whipping around those curves faster and faster. I, I was playing chicken with that sensible part of myself seeing if he would rear his head again, tell me to stop, tell me what, I, what was worth living for, what I had to do. Well, at the top of the canyon, there are these um, hairpin turns, sort of that, it, well, you've all seen it. When you get up there, there's that yellow sign with like squiggly lines, and at this point, there's sort of the, li the little line looked like a knot. And uh, as I rounded that first curve, I saw, and I'll never forget this light. In fact, I can still probably count the little sage bushes on the side of the road that sort of intertwine with the guardrail. I saw the sun had started to melt an ice bank on the side of the road. And I could see spreading out from the base of that ice bank a black swath cutting across the charcoal of the asphalt. And I had only a second to decide what to do. I couldn't tell if it was water or ice. And in that second, that sensible part of my brain finally woke up and he said to me, Joel, remember, remember your friend Leslie that died when she drove around a curve too fast? Remember that that, that time you hydroplane? It doesn't matter if it's water or ice, you go careening right over that cliff. Remember how there could be a car coming back around that blind curve? Well, my right foot just stomped on that accelerator. And the, tar the tachometer spun up at 7,000 RPMs, and the car lurched forward. And as I started around that curve, I didn't have to look out the right side mirror into the gaping abyss. I could feel it sucking at the car, pulling me to the side. And as my front tires hit what I believe was that black spot, I felt like I was flying. And a minute later, I did make it to the top of that mountain. Now, maybe it was luck. Maybe it was the brand new tires. Maybe it was something else. I still arrived at that top of the mountain with no friends, no place to go. But I knew I was alive, and at that moment, that was enough. And now, when I have an emo moment and I have to self-locomote to recover, I walk. <laughs>